All right. Good morning, Faith Chapel. It's good to be here. It's good to be. Uh, it's good to be here. Good to see you. Turn with me to Luke chapter five. That's where we are in our study and traveling through Luke. Sometimes you may wonder why we're going through Luke. It's telling the story of Jesus, and we're to be like him. And to be like him, we should know him. And to know him is to read his book that he left behind. So last week and the week before, we, we raised a question. And the question was, why did Jesus come to the earth? And you'd say, well, he came to die for our sins, and you'd be correct. Why did why did, Jesus, um, why did Jesus really come? And you could give a lot of answers, but the main reason that Jesus came is found in 1 John 3, verse 8. And that says, the Son of God was manifested and he came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came, to put all of Revelation discusses the works of the devil. So who is the devil? Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says he's the God of this world, little g. He's, his work is to blind people from the truth. 1 Peter 5, 8 says he's a roaring lion looking to devour and prowling around and his work is to overwhelm believers. 2 Corinthians 11, 4 says he's in direct contrast to, uh, well, actually, you know, the other day I asked people at the nursing home, tell me what the devil looks like. And the usual answer is he looks red, he has horns, and he carries a pitchfork. No. The Bible says he's an angel of light. He walks and works deceptively. He's, he's, he deceives. I, I'm missing a word here. He, he's not red. He doesn't carry a pitchfork. He's disguised. Because one day, one day in God's kingdom, he'll be soundly defeated, soundly. Revelation 20, verse seven to 10, and 15, 11, all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord. That's why Jesus came. He came to defeat the devil. Now, secondly, how, how did he do it? How is he gonna go around defeating the devil? What was the process he entered into to begin his work of defeating the devil? First, he became a man. Philippians 2, 7. He was made in the likeness of men. God became man. That's what's called deity, the divinity of Christ. He was both God and man. We'll see that today in the story of Peter. Number two. He endured our weaknesses, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. It says we were, he was tempted like in all things like we are, yet without sin. Number three, he was rejected by man, Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken. By who? His own people. Number four, he was then handed over to be crucified. As a criminal, he carried his own cross. John 19, 16 says, he was crucified with thieves and counted as a thief. Five, he was seen by many. Acts 1, 1 to 3, where he was seen by many people with many infallible proofs that he indeed was Jesus Christ. For 40 days, he walked around talking to people. Number six, he ascended to heaven, Acts 1, 9 to 11. He was taken up, as it says, he was taken up in a glorified body, in a resurrected body, having defeated death. Step one of defeating Satan. 
He defeated death. I think when Christ died on the cross, gave his life, Satan yet let out a whoop and said, yes! Until three days later, he was taken up to his rightful place at the Father's throne. He was taken up while the disciples were looking up, gazing up. And then they heard angels saying, this same Jesus who went into heaven will also come in like manner. Earlier, and, and then finally seven, he left the men that were standing there with words. And we have a record of those words right here. That's what Jesus left us with. And he said, in earlier conversations, they'd said, well, well, Lord, you know, is, is this the time you're going to show us the kingdom? Well, we talked for three and a half years about the kingdom. You're disappearing now. What about, what about this kingdom you talked about? As he keeps rising into the heavens. And he said, you will be my witnesses. So that's how he set about to conquer and defeat the enemy in a nutshell. So why did Jesus do what he did? We talked about why he came, how he did it. He defeated death. One day he'll defeat Satan for sure. And now thirdly, why? Turn me to John chapter 20, verse 31. John, the gospel of John, chapter 20. We're going to begin to establish a little scene here. John, the writer of the Gospels, there are four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John says in 20, 30, and 31, these words, John 20, 30. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, which are not written. But these are written. These ones that we have written here, John says, and it could be applied to Luke and Mac, Mark and Matthew. These are written. These words. Think of it now. There were things that John thought of. For example, he might have said, you know, I remember a story when we were down in the valley one time. No, no, we're not going to put that story in. I remember one time he was over in another village and something happened. No, we're not going to put that one in either. How about the time that he, 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 uh, he did this or did? No, we're not going to do that either. We're, we're going to skip those stories and those are forever lost in history. We'll only find them in eternity. But these are written, the ones that are included here. Why are they written? So that you may believe. The ones that are included here are enough. Enough for us to believe who Christ is. There are a lot of things. So you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Who is the Christ? The Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh, John 1, 1 to 3. And that by believing, you may have life in his name, eternal life. Well, what's eternal life? John 17, 3 says this. What is eternal life? Well, you think it's just going to heaven and being with Jesus, but you can have eternal life now. Jesus described eternal life, and this is what he said. As he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane to his Father in heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, and the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh to all you have given him, he may give eternal life. And then he describes eternal life. Here it is. This is eternal life. Are you listening? That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That they may know, that they may know, that they may believe, that they may have everlasting life. Living in him. There's a lot more to that. I just want to present it to you, then keep going and we'll see. So what's the alternative to having life in Christ? There's only one other option. 
eternal death, which means total and final separation from Jesus forever. Finally, in 1 John 5, verse 20, why did Jesus do what he did? Actually, you know what? I think we should turn to it. 1 John 5, verse 20. We write the book presently before Revelation. 1 John 5, verse 20. <clears throat> and we'll get to Peter in just a minute. 1 John 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God, the Messiah, has come. We know. And we'll find out how Peter began to know. And has given us understanding in this book that we may know him who is true, not false. And we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life so that we may know him who is true, genuine, as opposed to Satan who is false. And we are in him, and that's the foundation of life. Now, all that to say, just overlooking all that as three things, why he came, what he did, how he did it, and why he did it. It's just an over 30,000 foot view of all that Jesus did and said. Now back to John chapter 20, verse 30. John again brings up the subject of not telling every story that he knew. John 20, verse 30. <clears throat> Actually, John 21, I'm sorry, John 21. We read John 20, verse 30. Many other signs written not included. There are many things that Jesus did. Many more demons, many more healing, many more teachings. Many more wanderings among the people. It's not recorded. John 21, 25. Here he says, there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that could be written. There could have been many more books written, but some are excluded, some are included. But these are written. And you can be sure that the ones that are included in the Bible are important. And that brings us to Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Again, remember, this story is included for a particular purpose. Let's read the story. Follow with me as I read Luke 5, verse 1 to 11. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And Jesus, he, saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their boats. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked Simon, or him, to put out a little way from land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he, Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon Peter answered and said, Master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I'll do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now, why do you suppose this particular story is one of the saved stories? Not the one that John said, no, nah, we're not going to include that one. We're not going to write about that detail. Why this one? Why this one in the early part of Jesus' ministry? What's in the story that Jesus wants us to know? 
Is it about fishermen working hard and that we should work hard all our life? Is it about the nets, how we catch people? Is Jesus speaking from a boat? Is that significant? Should we speak from a boat? Is Jesus calling the men to follow him? Is, is that what the story point is? Is it leaving all to follow him? Is that, is that the point of Jesus? Is that what we're supposed to learn here? One couple commentaries mentioned this. As one boat was filled with fish, the other, they signaled to their partners and to help them. So that means each person, each Christian, each church should help other people. Is that the point of the story? Just why this one story here? Well, it is about Jesus speaking from a boat. It is about fishermen. It is about helping another. It is about <coughs> Jesus uh, teaching. And he was, you notice he was, uh, the crowd was pressing around him. So he pushed off to get away from the people so he could speak to them. It was that. It was about the lake known for its many fish and many families lived on its waters. Jesus saw two boats, but there were hundreds of boats on the lake at any one given time. It's a large lake. It was about the boats. It was about the boats. After resting on the shore after a night of fishing and they're cleaning up their nets. It was about Jesus setting some distance from the crowd to teach them. It was about Jesus getting into Peter's boat, not the other boat, Peter's boat. It was about speaking to Peter directly. Notice that in the story. They get into the boat, there's four guys there, probably their father was standing on shore, assuming there's servants nearby, but Jesus speaks only to Peter. That's significant. And the others just overheard. But really, why this story here about fishing, about boats, about nets breaking? Do we read the story and sing that little song? What's it, how's it go? Uh, Lois isn't here to help me, but Peter, James, and John in the sailboat. You know that little song we sing in school? Linda knows it, right? You don't know that one? Oh, Kathy knows it. Peter, James, and John in the sailboat. Jeff, you heard that one? Cat fished all night, caught no fishes. Jesus on the shore. And that's the gist of the song. And that's what we remember. But is that the point of the story? It's that and more. Do we read this story? Do we read this story 1 to 11 and say, hmm, that's interesting. Jesus helped men catch fish. Maybe if you're a good businessman, you'd say, hey, Jesus, come around once a week. We'll have a business. You tell me where the fish are and we'll double, triple, quadruple our business. Because they lived on fish. That's what they ate. They didn't have... They didn't have a fish and chips restaurant. They ate them fresh, maybe dried them or fried them, had them next day or two. But that's it. No freezers, no refrigerators. <clears throat> it's that and more. But again, I said already, the conversation is directed to Peter. He gets into Peter's boat. It's Peter who reacts to the catch of fish. It's Peter now who sees the Lord in a different light. The other ones did too, but Peter is the focus of the story. It's the main character. The story pivots around Peter. Now, just back up a little bit. Where did Peter and Jesus meet? Just to remind you that Jesus met Peter and John, one, John 1, John 1.42. Andrew brings, brings Peter and says, we have found him, the Messiah, we found him. And ultimately, Peter went and followed Jesus to where he was, and Jesus said, what do you want? And Jesus said, come and see. Peter was with Jesus at the wedding in Cana. He saw Jesus make water into wine. He saw that. He saw Mary, Jesus' mother, doing this and telling him what to do, 12 pots of all that. But Peter was still fishing. He saw Jesus. He followed him occasionally, but he was still fishing. Peter heard Jesus preaching about the kingdom in Matthew 4, where Jesus begins to preach about the kingdom. He was probably in the synagogue. Of course he was in the synagogue. He was a good Jew, initially following Jesus off and on. And, 
And uh, as, as rabbis, the culture of the day was, if you were a teacher and called a rabbi, which Jesus was known as, you would leave the classroom and go downtown and you'd have your students. Sort of like when you go to the hospital and the doctor makes his rounds and he comes into the room and with him come a bunch of interns with their notes and their pads. That's what a rabbi did in Jesus' day. He would walk around and as he was walking around, he would teach his students observing him. And Peter saw that, and he was one of those following Jesus. So Peter saw Jesus preaching and healing and casting out demons. And then Jesus comes to Peter's home, and his mother-in-law is sick with a fever, and she was about to die, and Jesus heals her. And Peter is the one of the men, when Jesus disappeared, like we talked about last week in Luke 4, after casting out the demons, Jesus just suddenly disappeared. Gone. Where is he? We don't know. Did you see Jesus? No. Nope. I didn't see. Did you see Jesus? No. Nope. I've seen. Him. Hey, fellow over there. Did you see Jesus walk by? No, nope. I haven't seen. Him. Disappeared. And it was Peter in Mark one thirty six that found him. Where was he hiding? Doesn't say. So now Jesus finding walking on the shore saw two boats. It just says two. He picked on two boats. He saw they were pulled in on the shore after a night of fishing. He saw Peter and James and John and Andrew and Zebedee and the servants working on the nets. But he speaks directly to Peter. He gets into Peter's boat while the others watch and believe. And here is the point of the story. It's two, it's two words. Notice in verse five, Jesus gets into Peter's boat. There's so much to the story, but I want to point out this. It's the deity of Jesus, his divine nature. Gets into the boat and says, let's go back fishing. Hey, master, we've been out all night. But let's just stop here for a minute. Jesus has the respect of many people. It says that people crowded around him so much so that he pushed away from them and it says they were listening to the word of God. In Luke 4 earlier, they spoke well of Jesus. In 31, they were amazed at his authority. Chapter 5, verse 1, they're standing around and Peter's listening to every word. They have respect for Jesus. So the first word he addresses Jesus is master, which means a title of respect, one who commands authority, one who bosses. He's a teacher. It's the same word that Nicodemus used when he approached Jesus at night and says, master, we know you're a teacher come from God because nobody can do these things except he's from God. So he recognizes the authority and the power of Jesus. So Peter, along with hundreds, maybe thousands of others, recognized Jesus' authority. They respected his ability to heal people. He's grateful. He healed his mother-in-law, who immediately got up and made dinner, to have power over demons. Peter perhaps knew the guy personally. He was such an agitation, and finally Jesus heals him, and he has respect for Jesus. He, along others, were, what you call in verse 9, amazed at Jesus' power and authority, like his wife, his friends. I'm sure they went out fishing at night and they talked about it. You, you, know, you know, Andrew, the other night Jesus was talking about something and they would converse about Jesus on the boat while they were fishing. Peter was very familiar with Jesus. Peter knew Jesus very well. Peter even followed him on occasion and walked around and he called him master. And this is where many are today. They know Jesus only casually. They know him as a great teacher. They know him, they've heard about the storms and they use the Bible as a reference guide. If I don't feel good, then I read this verse. If I, don't, if I feel unhappy, then I read that verse. They're familiar with the songs, Peter, James, and John in the sailboat. And that's all they know about Jesus, but there's more here. They're casually acquainted with Jesus 
Well, I, I, I'm like Peter. I, I follow him. I, I got to make a living, you know. I got to fish. They know some about Jesus, but that's the limit. And here's something I want you to think about. The knowledge of many today does little or nothing to interfere with their way of living. Think about it. Has the knowledge of Jesus interfered with your way of living? If it has not, you don't know him. That's what it means to know Christ. And there's the point of the story. I said it before. It did for Peter. And that's the whole point. First, Peter addresses Jesus as master who told him to let down the nets because he knew Jesus could do this. We worked all night. By the way, we're experienced fishermen. We've got tough hands and we're going to hurt you know, like the fishermen do. And you're just a woodworker. What do you know about fishing anyway? But I have respect for you. I'll honor your request. Because Peter recognized Jesus as a man with authority, as a man with power, as a man who demanded respect. Of course I'll let down the net. But after a night of desperation, catching nothing, notice carefully now, Peter changes his address to Jesus. Notice what he says, from master, authority, I respect you, to verse eight. And Peter saw that. He fell down at Jesus' feet saying, get away from me, now not master, but Lord. And that's a whole different word. He changes the word from master to Lord. His word, his meaning changes, his tone changes, his body language changes. Now he's on his knees in front of him, where before he wasn't. He fell down at Jesus' feet. Now he knows Jesus. He had life eternal. He fell down at his feet in awe and complete amazement. Notice what he said. He objected before only to the voice of authority. Now he says, I am a sinful man. Why did he say, I'm a sinful man? I, I, I know you are. I know who you are. Because now he's saying, after the catch of fish, think of it, keep it in your mind. Large boats, empty before, totally empty. Authority uh, powerful, uh, well-skilled fisherman, and this guy gets in the boat who knows nothing about fishing. He tells him, go fish. And now the boat is full down to the top of the line. The water's coming over the edges and it's full of slimy, slippery fish. And they know, they know at that instant it could not have been anything else but the divine power of God. He knows, Peter knows. So now instead of master teacher, now you're the supreme authority. That's why I read Psalm 8. He's a controller. Peter now immediately recognizes that he's in the presence of not just a man, but a holy one who exercises his power over creation and he was overcome with shame of his sin. From the very first time Peter saw Jesus, he saw a man, but now he sees God. Just look at the fish. Nobody can have done this. Verse nine, I love the phrase, for amazement had seized him. Amazement had seized him. What does that mean? Amazement means to be exceedingly struck in your mind or to be completely astonished. To be beside yourself, like you see something you can't hardly believe. Oh, oh, no, that's Peter. To be perplexed, to be frightened, to be startled. And by the way, the opposite word of astonishment is, I'm bored. That's where a lot of people are today, bored. So when Peter saw who Jesus really was, he saw who he was for the first time. When Jesus revealed who he really was, more than a man, master, 
that he was Lord of all. You and I must do the same thing. When we realize we really are sinners, then and only then do we realize who he really is. So I ask you, who is Jesus to you? That's the story of this, that's the point of this story, not the fishing, not the boats, it is that. But do you find yourself on your knees before the Lord like Peter? I say again, until we are overcome by our own unworthiness, our own sinfulness, overwhelmed by our shortcomings. As Peter and his buddies, amazement sees them. Until amazement seizes you, like in Isaiah 6, 5, when Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up and he falls flat on his face and he said, I'm finished, I'm a horrible man. Or here in Peter, and then in Revelation, when John sees the Son of God on the throne, he falls flat on his face and he said, I'm finished. That's where we have to come. That's the point of the story. It's Jesus revealing his divinity, and it goes on throughout Luke. Jesus is and only must always be, let me start the sentence over again, it's a long one here. Until we are overcome by our own unworthiness, our own sinfulness, or overwhelmed by our shortcomings, like Peter and his buddies, and amazement seizes you, Jesus is and only will always be just a master just one great miracle worker, just a great powerful speaker, just a convincing personality and a good friend. He can never be your Lord unless you face your sinfulness. That's the point of the story in Luke 5, 1 to 11. Jesus showing his divinity. It's changing songs from Peter, James, and John in the sailboat fished all night and they caught no fishes. Jesus standing on the shore, something like that. Changing that song to holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons and the rest of the song. We change our song from the childish version of just knowing Jesus is a great fisherman to the presence of a holy God. Then and only then we'll realize how much of a sinner we really are. And the story goes on as we continue next week. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the feeble attempt to show your divinity. How you then showed Peter. <coughs> he realized that he was a sinful man and he stood before one greater than a master, but Lord Lord of all, creator, sovereign of the universe. And it happened again in another situation where Peter, casting himself, seeing himself as a sinner, throws himself into the water before Almighty God and help us to do that. Because one day, one day we will see Almighty God. We will see the Lord Jesus, the perfect uh, demonstration, the perfect image of the Father. We'll see him face to face. Help us now to come into conformity to who he is. I pray for these who've come today. In the name of Jesus, I pray.